That's how we own it. Welcome, welcome, welcome back, family. It's Tamika D. Mallory. And it's your boy, my son, the general. And we are your host of Street Politicians, the, the place, place where, where the streets and politics meet. Yes, streets yes. and politics. That's what we do. And that's what we're talking about today. Streets, streets and, and politics. politics. As always. How was your week? It's, you know, it's been... <laughs> Okay. A week. So you a got week. your little Carolina blue on. I have places to go after this show. Okay. That's all I have don't, to don't say. Hurt you don't, don't, hurt know don't hurt them. Don't hurt my personal business. That's your thing. But I got things to do. You know, I do go on dates. I just, I just, you know. Listen. I just thought it. Well, enjoy yourself, man. State it. So you know, after the show today, have a, a suitor, a, a suitor that a, wants to date. There is a, there is a nice young man. Young man. Who okay. asked me to go out to dinner, and I'm going to do that. Okay. okay. But not before you put your little... Oh, and I'm going to be nice when I get there, because I've Jay's been drinking elixirs. Jay's elixirs. Now listen to me. Young black woman. Young black woman. Doing big things. And she came in here with some Hennessy and Kiwi. And this now, is... I don't this know is... about none of y'all, but Hennessy and Kiwi is a thing for me. <laughs> oh, it's the it's Hennessy, the, it's the the Hennessy for me. It's the Hennessy and the Kiwi. It's the Hennessy and the Kiwi for you. Mine is passion fruit sangria. And it's a it's a frozen specialty cocktail. This has Hennessy in it as well. Her IG is at J Elixirs. That's E L I X I R S. Yes. And this is a real damn good drink. Yes, man. Listen, it's a real we, good we drink. Like you stuff. almost finished with yours. Yeah, I drink. See, we like stuff. So if y'all got something y'all want to give to us, you know, you got a business, a brand, something, drinks, some food, some clothes. No, don't bring me no food. Some money. You don't. Don't bring me food. Don't bring me food. Oh yeah, because you know how you know. No, I listen. I have two things that happened recently that I just said I just. Lord have mercy. This lady. The first thing is that someone who cooks food. They friend got mad, which you know I don't believe in. When you get mad with people, you want to tell all folks business. Mm. But I'm real glad this person told the other person's business yeah, because this is the woman is a chef, and she, you know, people love her. And the friend got mad and said, "Yeah, but I saw the rats eating through the aluminum, and you just basically fixed it up and served it to people and anyway." Pluck roaches out. And I had to pluck. I helped you pluck the roaches Lord. out the pan, and I'm saying, "What?" That's one of them things that even if she lying, she could be right. So I just You're right. You try. Just, exactly. You know what I'm saying? I can't. You could I can't, be right. And so that's that yeah, that that's that messed me up. And I think the person that I saw do this doesn't realize that it's a problem. Were you allowing your pet to eat off of the silverware that you serve food off of in your yeah, kitchen? Kind of and nice. then you go hang out. But you know what it people? is? A lot of these people, their pet is their, their kid. Nah, I can't. Well, and I hear okay. what you're saying because a lot of these people see their pet as a child. They don't see him as an animal or none of those things. That's true. So they figure, I clean the plate, I clean the silverware, so that it's good. That is the nastiest thing ever. I'm just you trying to not tell you. Want, now, you should. People well, is kissing their dogs in the mouth. Well, so what's the difference? If they Ugh, kissing please. the dog in the mouth, why are they not letting the dog lick off the silverware? I'm just. But being don't. Honest. But why would? But you let the dog lick off the silverware that only you use. Yeah, but and, don't and the same invite people, people to your house the and put, they kiss you on the cheek. They do everything. That's so nasty. It's, it's, it's just so a nasty, and that's why in my family when I, when we were growing up, we would go to people's house, and you know the storyline. Don't ask these people for no food. Don't ask them for nothing to drink. Get your ass in the corner. Sit down. Don't say nothing until I'm ready to go. Cause and my mother used to say, cause so and so nasty. <laughs> <laughs> I know for sure. So and so nasty. nasty. We ain't gonna eat nothing. You nothing. Ain't gonna eat nothing you better when not we eat go. A damn thing over here. <laughs> over here. Cause she nasty. And they and it's true. You know there are more people in the world who are nasty than not. I just want you to know. I mean, I, I would I would um believe that. Yeah, people people have catering businesses out there. Hygiene is not a thing. And they home be nasty, nasty, nasty. And they want to cook stuff and go out into the world and, and there's people that's, other people. My mother used to call it nice nasty. Mm. You understand? They look clean and all that. And they and you go and you be like, these oh. people, it's filthy. No, that's a, listen. That's a thing. That's nice a nasty thing. is filthy. You got a lot of girls. I, t- I, t- you know, I try to talk to my son about it all the time. You got a lot of girls. You see them outside. They in their bag. They looking good. That thing is put together. They wash that stinking thing when they get ready to go out and meet a man. It's their house thing. is nasty. Okay, they don't mm. wash their bed sheets. I, I call my son. He lives on his own. I call him one time. Did you wash your bed sheet? He's like, Mom, you know. 
I wash my bed sheets. Why? Because you've been making me wash my own bed sheets since I was nine, ten years old. But there are people that don't wash their stuff, they don't wash their towels, and they just nasty. And I, I have a problem with the fact that you want me to eat food from your kitchen that you don't let the dog, the cat, or whomever else lay on top of it, eat out the plate. Now, one could say as pushback that you go out to a restaurant and, and eat off of a do? fork and a plate that has been used by thousands and thousands of people. But you know what your girl does. May I have she the plastic, please? Plastic. Well, do you have plastic? Can I have a plas plastic wear? This is true. You know. So anyway, but a lot of things happen. I mean, first of all, Jay-Z, <laughs> wow. Like, oh, they're going to say, y'all with Jay-Z, Rock Nation, they brought your soul. You want to talk about Jay? <laughs> Listen, man. The man keep making good moves. The man, man is out the here. The man keep making business moves, man. And, I, and and we know firsthand what he's done for this movement, how he supports silently. A Let's long look for time. For a long time. So, listen, I have no problem with saying Shout that. out to Jay. Shout out to the GOAT. You know, the greatest of all times. He showed you how to take it from the, from Marcy Projects to Billionaire's Row, man. You, you just can't And the complain. crazy thing about it is that what people don't understand is that you can actually pick up the phone and call Rock Nation and get somebody on the phone who is willing to listen to any issue. Yeah. You can tell them anything. You can call and say somebody got killed, and the next thing you know, they ready to put billboards up. They ready to spend money. Do you know how much it costs to buy an a page like an a, a page in like the Washington Post and the New York Times? They do that all the time. You know what's crazy for me is how many people like just black people in our community, do we see reach a level of success that Jay Z has and tries to do something positive that people don't tell? Oh, it's not enough. He doesn't do enough. No, but he I'm doesn't saying, do but, it right. Who who he is doing do right. like who do is enough. the person that they saying yo this person is doing it right like that they didn't just tear down? Who is the person that you see that is vocal about you know things going on in our community that just not saying yo I'm I'm just getting some money and that's it that vocal about things going on in our community that have taken the stance against you know. Civil rights issues uh, for civil for civil rights, rights mm -hmm. issue against police, you know, reform that stuff that have put their their voice and their money where their mouth is, and that hasn't received some level of just anger from our community. Well, I guess all of them have because I want to say we just celebrated the ninety fourth birthday of Harry Belafonte, and I want to say Harry Belafonte, but then I think about the fact that I'm I'm seeing it in real time that now that he's an elder that people are celebrating him. Now that he's ailing as an elder, people really celebrate him. But the stories that he tells of when he was actually using his money to help Martin Luther King and, and, how to, he and had the movement. To, he had to be silent in, this, in, in support. Some family. of them. Some, some of, of his he, support. He, mm -hmm. You know, some of his support because he know he had to be the person that was revered in the public to be able to take his finances and then be able and to support back the movement. About, you know, so it's it's really crazy when so, you think But you about never it. can do enough. You didn't never. do it right. You didn't do it. Never. It's not, it Everything's wasn't on, wrong. Everybody's conspiracy, Illuminati. It wasn't on paid, the left side in paid, the morning. Exactly. You walked out on the right side. No. I put my hand over my eye. I told you this before. I don't before. know why you did I, that. I did a picture me. because the magazine that um that I was in, I was magazine, that's one of the things that they do is like um, they, they cover an eye and it's all about like yeah, you the sure you soul know the Illuminati and, and I wasn't there. Right? No, they said it was Illuminati. Who, you the Illuminati. I'm saying, but was they got a whole. But where was I at when you know what I'm saying? Because we we work. Well, but when 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 did they like recruit you? When do you go to the meetings? I wonder know? about that. Where do you like drink the blood <laughs> and all that? With the, the you blood. Didn't drink You're supposed blood. to drink blood and sack. Who's the sack? Like what's going on? Tell me. I ain't never hear you had to drink no blood. Yeah, they say you got to drink the blood. I thought the they blood. get in touch with you and they kind of like tell you that you you in their thing and then you something happens. So when do you go to the meetings? You asking me? Yeah, I don't know. You, I'm asking you. you I told Illuminati. you they catch you. You be doing stuff, your hands, and they said you in the Illuminati. I'm, I ain't been to no Cardi's in the Illuminati, too. So you could be I in the never saw none of these so people in the So you could be in the, in the in Illuminati, the and you don't know? Like, I think so. Oh, okay. I think so. I think I wanna, that you don't have to. Because if I'm in the Illuminati, I should be able to get some of the perks that come with it. Cause they say we do get that. the perks, because they what think we got... Billions of dollars, and we, you know, they, they, they feel that? like we do get Billions it. Billions of dollars. Huh? I wonder, does anybody who's actually in the Illuminati talk about it? Like, is it is it only private, or because if so, we should invite them to explain. Yeah, man. What is, is it? it? Listen, if, if you are if you are part of the Illuminati, <laughs> you know, we would love to have you 
on street politicians because we want because we want to know about how we got because we somehow we got a part of Illuminati. We want to know, like you know, because it's it's the secret is such a secret society that the people who's in it don't even know. Right. That's oh, word. A big now, oh, that's big secret. Because we in it and we're a part of it, you know, and, and we got the signs down. But <laughs> we we know also, and we don't even know. Right. You understand so what I'm saying? We so want. We want, we want somebody that who actually knows. Anybody that knows, call please. us so you can be part get of on Luminati, the show. Please hit we us. Want, on we want to talk about it. it. That's a good thing. So yeah. Jay Z sold his champagne. Uh, well, he didn't sell it all, but they acquired some portion of his yep, champagne. And- and then, and now the story around the champagne is funny because I was in the liquor store buying Christmas presents for people and I was actually buying, um, what's his name, Uncle Nearest. He is a black man who actually uh, created Jack Daniels and I believe he, the white folks stole it from him. Mm. Um, and so he created his own brand. I, shout out to Kenny Burns, who's always uh, supporting and promoting Uncle Nearest. Uncle Nearest is whiskey. I had one shot of that whiskey and I wasn't even standing up straight. So it's serious, serious, serious stuff. I ain't never heard it. I got to guess. Yeah. So when I was in the liquor store, the reason why I bring up Uncle Nearest is because that I was trying to find something black owned that's different to give to many of the men in my life. Mm -hmm. And when we happened to be standing by a case that had all of the fancy champagne and it was Cristal in the case. And the man starts explaining to me the story of Cristal. And this is a white man, and he's telling me, he says, yeah, you know, Cristal, he says, funny. He said, I remember a time. He said, I had this liquor store for 20 years. You know, it might have been longer than that. And he said, he said, and I remember a time when, you know, I was trying to sell, I was trying to get Cristal into my store. And he said, you couldn't get it. They wanted you to buy the company that owns Cristal, they wanted you to buy, say, four cases of something else, and then they would send you, like, two bottles of Cristal. But you couldn't get enough of it to really, you know, sell it in your in your establishment. So he said, and then they went out and made some kind of statement about not wanting it to be a part of hip-hop culture. They didn't want black people to buy their stuff, basically. And he said, and when they did that, he said, they went they down so far. He said, I can, he said, they shipped me the boxes <laughs> now. It's everywhere. We laughed together, but Hip-hop. right, right above it was Ace of Spades, mm. and he said, and this guy monopolized the whole movement. Like he figured out how to come forward with the champagne line, that's it. And, and and because he he because Jay understands that black people that's that's the dictate market. culture. Di- we, we, we are culture. the culture. That's right. Exactly. So he leaned into his own people. So with that being said, Ace of Spades is now. Um, you know, I don't know how much money he made, but he made a whole lot of money. And then title, he sold a majority stake to Square. Yep. Right? Square. To Square. So Jack Dorsey, I think, owns Square. I think. See, these things I'm not be trying to learn. Listen, man, listen. You might be right. I might be. I believe you're right about that. I think that. I'm right. I think I'm right. So, so uh, yeah, so now Square owns that. So he made some big business moves. And I don't know anything about Jay's business mind and how they operate. But what I do know is that in, with a pandemic, I can only imagine that once you see what it looks like for the economy to cripple in a way that it's not being controlled by man, this is, or it could have been man-made, but it's not at this point, the pandemic has gone far beyond what men can control, men and women can control. Yep. And so once you see how it can cripple um, uh, underneath you and really shut down everything and there there is no hierarchy or in, in with this pandemic it could touch anybody at any time I'm sure that new business ideas and ways to operate had to come forward and I think we all have to be able to operate from that space we definitely do man. I say that all the time you know I read a place that during pandemics and situations like that billionaires will go broke and poor people will become millionaires, you know, mm. because the way of life that people have capitalized off for years, you know, that made billions of dollars no longer exists. Mm. You know, when we're not inside society, there are a lot of, you know, in-person things that, that really took hits. And then there was a lot of things that you had to be innovative and mm-hmm. cre- create, you know, online things. And when you look at the pandemic, Jay-Z, the two things that he got right now were flourishing in the pandemic, right. music and online music. 
was flourishing and alcohol was an essential job. It was, job. An, essential, it was an essential, essential job. Service. Alcohol was one of the things that never closed. So crazy. you got to think of it, even though it's crazy, but when you're a businessman and you're looking at that, you're saying, yo, even in the pandemic when people couldn't leave, alcohol was one of the main things that continued to sell. I wonder how so, much of it like made people do crazy things. A lot of it. A lot of it, but I'm saying it, it contributed to either making them do crazy things or calm them down. Because a lot of people were stressed. And when you're dealing with stress, a lot of people go to drugs and alcohol. You know, mm-hmm. we, another thing he invested in, he he just became one of the um, weed sellers. In, 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 I, in Listen, he's not a weed seller. He sells weed. No, man, man that's not what it is. He's he said in, he's selling weed in the open. He, now, he said in his round. I'm telling you what he said. He said, I'm selling weed in the open. I'm freeing people from jail. Well, that's I think he that he is, He I believe that he is now creating equity within the marijuana business That's right. that has many different Shout out to facets. Him and, Biggs, you know, and they doing they doing something and that. I and I know for sure being a part of conversations that the plan is to ensure that other that other black people are able to find a pipeline right. through the marijuana Jay. business that a lot of up, white baby. folks have already been able to find success in and Jay is a person that will look at I can say this 100 percent that he will look at people who came from the streets who were locked up for selling marijuana yeah. and figure out how to turn them into true entrepreneurs and i think that's what it's all about that's what it's about man so hit me up you hit know, you up need me, a, need me a job over there at them them the weed plants y'all got over there man Lord, hit mercy. us up man I, you, I did some time you, in jail man look out for a brother man look out for a brother you is crazy 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 now um, shout out shout out to jay though we just commemorated the one year anniversary of Breonna Taylor um, being in peace, murdered queen. in my judgment murdered. by assassinated. The, assassinated. That's right. Make the word strong, That's right. strong you know, about assassinated what happened to our home. sister. We held a rally. Uh, other cities uh, participated and had rallies and vigils and other things to uh, remember her. We're never going to stop talking about never. Breonna Taylor. So people just get tired. Because we ain't going to never stop talking. You know, that's another thing. People are like, yo, y'all just want to go when something is hot. You know, why don't y'all talk about this? Why? No, we talking about Breonna Taylor because it was an issue that was brought to us by Attorney Crump before people were talking about it. That yeah. we really just seen as something that we needed to utilize our voice. You know, there were people on the ground. There were grassroots organizers who had been out there protesting for you for know, how many for days, days right? how many days? I, and I remember stating, you know, if we can't get justice for Breonna Taylor, a black woman who was sleeping at home and was killed, then we can't get justice for nobody. So this fight is going to be. You have to be end. so careful when you say sleep in her home and was killed because then you hear people out there saying, well, she was a, she was asleep when she was killed. She wasn't asleep. No, she, she was, was sleeping. She was sleeping in her yeah, exactly. home and the police knocked her Not, the door. And woke they you woke up. up. So that, right. that's the same thing to me. I ain't say she, she was awakened by. Yeah, she was awakened by the people who killed the her. The people so, who knocked on the door, yeah. which she didn't know exactly. were cops at the time. Okay. You can, yeah. you, can, you, can, you can be put. You got to say the specific. I'm saying the lady was sleeping at home mm-hmm. and ended up getting killed and assassinated by the police. Mm, that and that's happened. the bottom line. So, you know, we're we, we going to continue to fight for her. Much love to Tamika Palmer and her family, Janiah and. Bianca, Bianca and the and, whole, the whole gang. You know, Kenny, everybody. You Kenny know, everybody, Walker. everybody, man. We just, we, they, they, they are family now. So we can't, we can't turn back and we can't stop. So much love to them. Yep, and we, it's always gonna be justice for Breonna Taylor for me. Always justice for Breonna Taylor until justice for Breonna Taylor. That's right. So I was thinking, you was thinking? while I was, you know, getting deep in my head, which we already talked about last week. Sometimes we think too much, but. Um, I was thinking that, and this is really, really serious, Mice. It's really serious. The Senate blocked the minimum wage increase to fifteen dollars an hour, mm. um, and that you know happened a few weeks ago. And first of all, you've got a lot of people who don't understand how the government operates, and so therefore they're like, "Y'all told us to do all of this, and we still can't win." It's not an easy fix, and it will not be in one election. We actually have to flip more seats in the Senate in order to really, truly be able to pass legislation that we want to pass. Now, the truth of the matter, then they'll say, but you said we can control it. Well, actually, what we said is there would be a a split, a fair split. 
Now we want to pick off some of the Republican seats, right? So that we can create a tipping balance away from um, the, the ideology, if you will, of the Republican mindset, right? It's not Republican people. Like you said, it's not about you, Becky. It's not Republican people. It's not people who are Republicans. It is all y'all together and what you make up of in terms of the ways in which you operate and the, w and, and the ways in which you think we supposed to operate. So I was thinking, in my thought of the day, I want to understand what are people supposed to do with $7.25 an hour being the minimum wage. And now this is years and years and years that it hasn't changed and somehow or another, like, I'm trying to understand what the Republicans are thinking. I can tell you easy. They're, 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 they're um, saying to this self, people will make $7.25 an hour. That will not be able to sustain living. They will resort to crime. Mm. We can put people in jail. And then when they go to and jail. And when they go to jail, we jobs. can make money. There's jobs mm. that we create and we can make open more jails and become billionaires the same way capitalism has always worked. Mm. You know, because if you empower the poor, if you make the poor not poor, then there's no lower class. There's no capitalism works because there is a class of people who don't have. You know, so therefore they feed the economy. They are the people that the economy feeds on, the the have nots. Mm. So if people can make a survivable <laughs> aka a livable, a livable wage, yeah. then they don't have to commit crimes, you know, and the and their whole economy the falls economy out the falls bottom. The economy falls out the bottom right. because crime feeds so many things in this economy. You know, it feeds the jail cells, the police departments, it feeds security, everything that th this economy. Well, and, they also, and also don't forget about the, the market in terms of the products that are made That in are prisons. made in prison. Yeah. There's just so many different things that, you know, the economy needs poverty. We need poverty in this economy. Mm, so somebody gotta be at the bottom. Somebody gotta be at the bottom. So why would they empower people that have been poor, right? Be like, no, we need y'all to stay poor. We need y'all to continue to do things, and we're gonna make new laws that make it even harder for you to survive. You know, we're gonna in more taxes. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna force your hand. I said it in a spoken word. You know, we don't just need to you know to end us for prison. In prison, we need you to end the decisions. That lead us to prison. Mm. You know, we don't need to be mm. have to make those decisions whether we're gonna live or or die or we're gonna have to commit a crime to survive and feed our children. Nobody needs that. Mm. So, you know, that's that's what the whole mindset behind that well, is. Well, let me read this to you and you know, we can end it here because there's not much more to be said except to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result is insane. So we know that. So therefore, uh, we're gonna need that President Biden and that the Democrats get the point, uh, th we're not going to win these people over to our cause. They're, they're, not, they're not our friends. Listen they, to me, the bottom this line This whole is, idea of balance yeah. and yeah. what does he say? Unity. How are you going to unify with somebody who actually wants you dead? The bottom line is that they said that Trump is the leader of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. Trump hates you. He does not like you. He can't stand you. And he punishes anybody who sides with you. Mm. So all of these people understand that. So even the, the most person that you thought was cool with you, they do not want to go against the interests of the party and the party's leader. No so matter what. No matter what. I so mean, some of them have, but it's rare. Some of them have. It's very rare. And they've suffered the consequences. They've oh, been yeah. ostracized. Oh, and yeah. They've dealt with everything. So understanding that reality, Biden, you have to make real decisions. You have He's to utilize... Biden. No, I didn't. You can call him. I said Biden. Okay. You can call him President. I Biden. call Trump President Trump at I times. That, I don't. I call. I'm calling him Biden right okay. now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so understanding that reality, Biden, you have to make real exec executive decisions. You have to utilize the power that you have while you have the power because you've seen what they did when they had the power. You know, gangster. You got the gangster. You got the gangster. I mean, the you got the gangster. Gonna, only the strong will survive. That's the so this line. says. This is from Day Labor, Day Labor or Network. You know the Instagram, some the Instagram, <laughs> Instagram sometimes could be like Bible, right? So it says in February 2020, the average U.S. rent was one thousand four hundred and eighty-six dollars per month for an apartment. Okay. For rent to cost one third of your income, because that's the suggested amount. 
that you don't pay rent over one third of your income. You need to make $4,955 a month. Okay, so let's let's go back just to make sure people are clear. In February 2020, average rent was $1,486 a month. Mm-hmm. And if rent cost cost one third of your income, you would need to make roughly five thousand dollars a, a month. month. That's right. Now at forty dollars an hour every week, that would be twenty eight dollars and fifty nine cents an hour. The federal minimum wage is seven dollars and twenty five cents. So I'm just trying. To, we ain't gonna make We're it. We ain't gonna make it. There's no way. It's no way. You know, and, and it's mm. and it's sad because. It's well planned and it's orchestrated, and you know. And I tell people all the time, when I when I was telling people to vote, it was for a better opponent. And we're gonna hold this administration accountable. And while we holding them accountable, we understand that we need something different. And we gotta create. We gotta. We have to create what we want. You understand? We have to create. You know, um, people to put in office. We have to sit there and and cultivate. We got to cultivate our own body yeah. of people and make sure that we're putting ourselves in a position to win because, you know, where we are right now is just not going to... I'm not okay with it. I'm not fine. I'm not... No, you love Biden. You went and told people to vote for Joe That's Biden. That's what I did. You, he, he bought, paid you, uh, sold you. paid me. You, and you was, you know, you, okay. you, you was such an advocate. Advocate. You sold us into... More problems because Trump was doing the Trump best. Trump was one. really he, he was, was really, it. He was what he was. He was it. the best president for he black was the people. Best president it, yo, there ever. really was some some um, shoe shiners that was trying to tell me Trump was the best president that black people ever had. And and all I want to say is that everybody everybody can do something right, mm-hmm. right? Even the worst person they can do something right. But I'm just trying to understand. When you see folks running up the side of the wall, taking lives, and in fact, hanging nooses outside of the the Capitol, the Capitol of the United States of America, America, these people decided that they were going to perform an insurrection, and you think that we need to continue to reward and enhance that behavior and that somehow it's going to work out for black people, yeah, you, Good luck, buddy. you got it. You got it, buddy. Good not, luck. not me. And now the streets is talking. The streets are talking. And you know what the streets is talking about? What? What's this week? That powerful Grammy performance that you put on with Lil Baby. And, yeah, you know what I'm saying? I have my yeah. bull horn behind. Listen, listen. You had your bull. Don't you look. I ain't going to want to pat nobody on their back, but you know. Give you a little tap on the back, oh, man. You know, that was a powerful performance, man. Little baby. So I always liked that song. So when yeah. you was called to do that performance for the song, I was like, nah. And then when you seen it, it's just crazy. They really recreated Rayshard Brooks, Brooks, Brooks situation. situation. Yeah. They had the Wendy's on fire. Like it was, you seen all the theatrics. They had the protest. They had you at the podium. You know what I'm saying? And you was giving that Those word. Things happen. You gave some you gave a word. I tried. We Shout need everything that Mike freedom encompasses. Yes. And to accomplish this, we don't, we don't need, need allies. allies. We need accomplices. Woo! It's bigger than black and white. Yep. It's not a trend. This is our play. Yep, until freedom. And then they were screaming until listen. That man. was amazing. It was amazing, it man. Was amazing. So shout out to you. Yep. Shout out to Little the Grammys baby, for having the you and Grammys. Uh, Fatima Robinson, yes. who was the creative director for the entire Grammy show. Yep. Not just one particular segment, but the whole show. Black woman, incredible. Shout out to our sister, Valicia Butterfield Jones, who is the, the chief diversity officer um, at the Grammys now. Uh, and the work that she's doing to try to make sure that they are more in- inclusive of people who look like us. And our issues, more importantly, because all skin folk ain't kin folk. And of course, shout out to Killer Mike. He had a great part of the yep. performance. Shout out to Killer um, Mike, the brother as Killer well. Mike, my brother. Kendrick Samson. Kendrick Samson, That's who my played Ray Brooks. That's right. In, who played in, in, Ray yeah. yeah, so it was powerful. It was powerful, man. Nothing but love. You know, I didn't watch the whole show because, you know, I. I I just be moving ADHD. around. I got ADHD. I just seen us and I was amped. Yo, we did out there, you know, boom, boom, fist bumps, you know. So, yeah, 
Nothing but love. Nothing but Good job. Love. Good job. Good job. Well, you know, don't act like you don't want me to say that you helped me to I get mean, it listen, together. I mean, listen, we ain't gonna listen. I'm gonna do it. That listen, I, I, you helped me get it together That's because it. I was very nervous. Yes. And and you know what? And it, it brings up this idea that the well, same thing you talk about people being celebrated. We also were in the last two weeks, I think, or two weeks ago, um, two episodes of our appearance on Love and Hip Hop yep. came on. And, you know, people will say that we are uh, commercialized. Hollywood, commercialized. We, we Hollywood. And, you know, and, and why y'all doing all of this, you know, stuff for uh, these white uh, industries? Why are you a part of a show like Love and Hip Hop that we know has absolutely unequivocally been damaging to the black community. Mm-hmm. We know that. And we've said it. And yeah, well, and we I, acknowledge listen, it. Listen, I say it to them. I've said it to my my yep. dear friend Yandy who's a part of the show. I've said it to Mona Scott. I mean, we've had these conversations and they know how we feel and also they have their own feelings and particularly Yandy about the show and what she's had to do to try to maintain some civility and to maintain her brand of being who she is which is, you know, Yandy is a stand-up individual, um, and and that Shout and that's out that. To yep. But we got to get Yandy on the show. She hasn't. Yeah, been we got to I mean, she did in. the Yell uh, skincare line. We she need was to our interview business, her. Yeah, uh, we need to spotlight, interview her. but yeah, she needs. But yeah, to come but on. you know, just to bring it back to that, you know, people say that we commercialize, and it, and for me, and even though we've been critical, so the thing is, when do we give people the opportunity to try to change things, right? When do we say, okay, you've been doing this wrong? Do we say, you've been doing it wrong and, and don't say that they should do anything to change? You know, because when they reached out to us to do it, you know, Yandy Which, was like... Uh, you're talking about the Love and Hip Hop. The Love and Hip Hop. They was like, hey, listen, you know, we got this episode. It's about Black Lives Matter episode. We want to sit down, have the cast, have you guys talk, you know, talk about the importance of us utilizing our voices, about what's going on in the community. Just have real conversation that, that moves us away from what loving hip hop has been known for, mm-hmm. you know, uh, away from the drama and the ratchet and the beats and all that. This is an episode that we want to utilize your voices and highlight the work that you do, you know, and give you a platform to talk about the things that actually are going on in our communities mm-hmm. and what we need to do to combat those things. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the that's growth, you know, that's evolution. That's a step in the right direction. So I'm I'm. I don't. I think that's what it's about. If we, if the movement stays underground and people don't know about well, it, well, see, that's what I was. Gonna you know, say. and if they don't see us in lights and they don't see us on the same stages and on the same television programs that they see their favorite rappers on, right? How do we compete with that narrative? Mm-hmm. How do we compete with the narrative? You know, with some people are selling negativity and poison and, and and death to our communities. If you don't give us the same platforms to speak life into our communities, mm-hmm. right? So I'm all for. It whatever you call a commercial, utilize us. Utilize anybody, not just us, anybody who has a message, who is active in the community, who is leading us in the proper direction. Utilize every one of those people on... Put us on the biggest TV shows you have, the biggest programs. Make sure that we got 100 million people listening to us. So, Because we're advocating for something that makes sense. We're advocating for unity. We're advocating for every star, every influencer, every athlete. You know, LeBron James was very vocal this week. Somebody, one of these athletes, I think it was a soccer player or something, I don't remember exactly who it was, who said that he shouldn't be talking about politics. And he said, I'm never not going to talk about things that are wrong. I'm always going to stand on the side of right. And we need that. So make sure that you give everybody who's talking about something positive, that's talking about justice, that's talking about equity, that's talking about equality, the same exact platforms that you give those who talk about negativity. Absolutely. You know, give us the opportunity to spread our message as well. Absolutely. I mean, I I agree. And I think that we, and and it should not just be us. We should make sure that all the the different leaders and people who are really, really doing work and have been invested in this work for many, many years, that they get those platforms. You know, and I won't go back and repeat everything that you said because I think you said it perfectly um, that, you know, we... We, we want, how do we compete? We want to make sure that we get on the same stages so that we have a balance to the narratives that's being pushed to our people. That's right. So that's something that I agree with. I also would say, uh, you know, that people just need to stop being haters, right? That 
they just don't want to see other people out doing uh, things that they feel like they can't access. So that's 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 another issue. But we do have to acknowledge that many people have watched certain individuals go from the hood or the community or grassroots organizing to all of a sudden they have these big moments and they start to grow away from their people. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's a fear that I saw somebody write on your page, just don't sell your soul, you know, and I, and I went into the comments and was asking what gives you the impression that this, this man is selling his soul just because he's doing things on a larger scale at this point. But I realized the trauma of watching other leaders turn their yeah. backs on the movement and and get too big to even communicate with people you don't even want to speak to people you don't want to take a picture you don't want to take on certain cases and you know certain situations i know that uh, that is a part of the trauma that folks have been experiencing but as far as i'm concerned as long as i have breath in my body I recognize that I didn't have to cut corners and dilute my message in order to get to where I am. That's right. In fact, I have been doing the work for many, many years and having a hard time getting people on the on at this level to pay attention to my message. And in and and, and the hardest speech I ever gave where I said things that if I had to do it all over again and had to think about what was gonna come out of my mouth, I probably would not have stated. Right. I probably would have never talked about people burning down buildings, even though I didn't say I support it. But nonetheless, I referenced the idea that people need to stop asking us about rioting and things burning down when those corporations are not standing with the people and we are tired. So it was it was actually my hardest moment. Right. The thing that people said was the realest stuff that ever came out my mouth that put me in a position to stand on the Grammy stage and uh, and have other opportunities. And it's a quick story. There was something else that I did that I can't really talk about, but there was something else that I did that's really, really big. And there was an issue with some of the employees and how they felt they were being treated by the brand that we were working with. Mm -hmm. So they came to me. They found me online. They sent me a DM. And they said, hey, we want you to work on this. And our manager, my manager, Toya, found it. Um, you know, she saw it. She sent it to me. She said, how do you want to approach this? I let her know. I will not show up to set until this situation gets dealt with. Because whenever black women and sisters reach out to me saying, this is this is an issue, something that, you know, we're not being treated fairly, and we need you to look into this. And even though the, the, the brand came back with a response that made sense too, right? With the brand's response and their sort of defense, if you will, made sense as well. But I took a position that I would not take the job if they didn't do something to correct whatever was happening and what they called ended integrity. up doing called integrity and what they ended up doing was bigger than what was even being asked for because the, the, the brand had an opportunity to sit back and see, okay, here's a moment where we can make change in real time. One of these days we'll have the opportunity along with those women to tell the story of what happened. Um, and it's something you damn right. I'm proud of myself for being willing to stand up regardless of it, if it meant that I was going to lose opportunities, but I'll say this and I'll be done. And this is some real stuff that people need to understand. One of the things that made it possible for me to say no is that I was not financially hurting that I needed to take the job. And that's because I have all types of other things that I'm doing. And shout out to my brother Charlemagne, who has ensured every step of the way that he finds speaking engagements for me, help me get a book deal, help me with different things so that I wasn't in a situation that when this opportunity came up, it was the difference between me paying my rent or not. And because of that, I was able to say, well, I don't need it. So, you know, if y'all can't get it together, then I don't have to do it. You know, that's important when you think about your leaders, you think about black media, you and think about all of these people. that's why when you talk about 
ninety million dollars and you said <laughs> it ain't enough. It even ain't though enough. we even though we ain't got it. Even because the bottom line is dollars. if you have you want leaders to speak on your behalf, they have to be financially stable. They have to be able to pay their rent regardless if you blackball from every organization. Right. Because you have to be everything. able to, from everything, That's right? Because right. they will blackball you. They will make it so that you can't make a dime if you speak outside of what their interest is. Yeah. So if you if you really want leaders then you definitely should financially Stand support. Up for Don't them. let nobody Stand with, with them. The, what you're doing when people say what you're doing with the money what I'm doing with the money is what you should be doing with the money is making sure that you invest in the communities you come from you invest in the future leaders you invest in the grassroots organizations you invest in everything that we want to see in our beloved community but you also invest in yourself and to your make future. sure that you are independent of any corporation or entity so that you can hold them accountable and you can tell them to go to hell at any time that they are not invested in the interests of well, the people on that note Let's invest in women-owned businesses. Women-owned businesses. That's right. Since it's Women's History Month. Women's History Month. Let's invest in black women because no one hires black people the way black people do. Amen. We hire our people more than anyone else. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. And so today for our uh, small business spotlight, I'm, you know, I like all these little brands we've been bringing up. This to, particular man. brand is uh, something that women, and since we're talking about role models on our show today, I don't think we mentioned that our show topic is role models. Role models. Uh, and we have guests that are coming up that are incredible role models. Um, but this particular brand is a brand that was established by moms for moms. And mm. that's something that we need is, you know, brands that are out here targeting certain parts of our population that need services. And so we're going to have Latoya Bond come out. Our, our resident. Uh, uh, what is she? What our she business called? expert. Business uh, expert, resident brand Expert. Brand expert. That's Resident what... brand expert. You see that? <laughs> Toya, get, yo, tell you moving up, man. <laughs> Toya's she's moving, moving up. up. She's, she always been a brand yes, expert. That's why we no do doubt. all the things that we do. That's right. All Shout right. out to Toya. So she's going to come and talk about our small business spotlight. Thanks, Tamika and Mice, and welcome to the brand market. I am Latoya Bond, your resident brand whisperer. The brand that we're highlighting today is one of my faves. I love this brand. And I know today the episode was all about role models, right? And there's no bigger role models in a child's life than a mom. This brand was created by a mom for moms. Now, you know moms, we are hustling. We got a lot going on in a day. We trying to take the kids to school, come back, get ready, go on a Zoom call or go to the office. And maybe we want to go out after work to have a little drink. And we want to have clothes that are comfortable, but still cute. Something that is comfortable enough to go to a baseball game or a basketball game, but that also makes us feel cute and it's fashionable as well. I describe it as a cross between athleisure and streetwear because it's super fly. It's edgy, you know, for us girls that like a little bit of spice. It's super comfortable. And she has some basic classic pieces like hoodies and sweatshirts that's just good to throw on, run to the gym, run to the supermarket as well. I'm going to throw to Ayana Stevens, who's the owner and creator of the brand, so she can tell you more about why she created Rhythm. Thank you, Latoya, and thank you, Tamika and my son, for creating this platform. My name is Ayana Stevens, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Rhythm Lifestyle. Rhythm is a lifestyle brand that was born out of the need to create a no fuss fashion moment for moms on the go like me. It's for those moments when you have to go running behind your children, whether it's to their basketball tournaments or their track meets or their volleyball games. And you wanna be comfortable, but you also wanna be cute. A lot of times as mothers, we spend so much time investing and pouring into our children that we can oftentimes lose sight of ourselves and our own personal sense of style. So after spending months and months and months sitting in basketball gyms, feeling like I had on my mom uniform, I wanted to create something that brought out my own sense of style. So that as a mom, even if you're wearing your yoga pants or your t-shirt, if you throw on one of our camo jackets, it totally elevates your look. It is a showstopper, it is a statement piece, and it definitely brings a little bit of you to what you're doing for your kids. So everyone is asking us this question. What is Rhythm? How did the name come about? Where did it come from? 
it is a little a little trick. If you look at the words, it says redum. That's what it spells if you pronounce it grammatically or phonetically. It's pronounced redum. But we felt like when you think about women and you think about who we are to our families, to our friends, we are the rhythm of our families. We keep the beat, we keep the movement, we keep it going, you know? A lot of times people look at women as, you know, sort of the glue of their families, people who hold it down. And so when we looked at the word mother and we flipped it backwards, it was sort of very clear to us that rhythm was the way we wanted to pronounce our company, our brand. So rhythm is what you have. And of course, my husband and I really wanted to put our stamp of our family as part of our logo and our brand. And so you'll notice there are four lines. Those four lines actually represent my husband and I on the outside of Fear the White Lines and our two sons that we have poured so much into are the red lines in between. And so it really is us celebrating our family, celebrating who we are to each other, pouring into our kids. They're part of this business too. They work hard, they're employees. Uh, but being able to celebrate that womanhood, motherhood, in a very family kind of a way. And again, still making sure those women are out there looking fabulous. At Rhythm, we created several items that we know mothers and women around the country are loving. Whether it's our camo styles, our varsity jacket, we recently launched a line for spring, which will be coming out very soon. And we're really, really excited to continue to share this brand and this lifestyle and this movement with the world. If you're interested in joining the Rhythm Nation, you can find us online at rhythmlifestyle.com and on all social media outlets at Rhythm Lifestyle. Thank you again. And now back to you, Toya. Thank you, Ayana. Isn't that dope, y'all, that Rhythm is mother spelled backwards. I know I feel good and, and confident and, and super proud rocking this because I want everyone to know that I'm a mom. So I'm gonna toss it back to Tamika and Mice, but before I do, if you want your brands to be featured on the brand market, you can find the information below on how to find us. So for Women's History Month, you know, it's important that we focus on all aspects of what women go through, right? And we oftentimes talk about men who are incarcerated, men who've been incarcerated and come out and make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's some great brothers that we work with that are doing incredible work. But incarceration for women is a thing. It is. And in fact, women are the fastest growing population of those being incarcerated. And oftentimes, black women. Um, black women. And oftentimes, I wonder about Latino women as well. I don't know. We have okay. to um, ask our next guest about that. But oftentimes, women are overlooked. There are times in life when people come to me and they challenge me about things that I have said, or th as you said, they, but with respect. Because to be clear, if you disrespect me, I don't hear anything you said. The whole wall is down. I don't hear you. I don't have to respond. There's a guy that comes on my page every day, and he tells me he has the solution for racial justice. He has the solution. He knows exactly what needs to happen. But he has disrespected me on my page and also in other spaces where I've seen him so many times that, that I told him solution. that I will not be the one to take that solution and work on it. So if that's what's going to solve the problem for Give black people, you got to find somebody else to do it because I don't want any, I don't care what you have to say because of the way I've been treated. And I think most people feel that way. Maybe I need to grow up, but I'm not there yet. No, God ain't through with me yet. It's still a work in progress. Still working on me too. Um, but I I have been challenged about my lack of knowledge or, you know, lack of advocacy around certain issues. I didn't know that women don't receive as many visits oh, when I knew that. they're inside the system. I didn't know about the issues with like maxi pads and, um, you know, certain things that women, childbirth, essentials, that know. childbirth. It was so much that I had to be educated on from other women who've been incarcerated. And so today during Women's History Month. Um, we want to talk to our sister, Deanna Hoskins, uh, who is formerly incarcerated and is also one of the leaders, the president of Just Leadership USA, an organization that I love, we love. I mean, there's so many people at Just Leadership that we know. They have major advocacy work being pumped out of this organization. And I want to hear today, uh, Ms. Hoskins, about all that you know and just, just lay it on us. Tell us what we need to know about women who've been incarcerated and the struggle to help address the issues 
um, around our sisters. Thank you guys. Thank you for having me on today. So first I kind of want to tell your guests about Just Leadership, which is a national organization that is founded by and led by formerly incarcerated individuals, the mm-hmm. first in the country to actually be um, ran by people with the personal experience of incarceration mm-hmm. fighting to decarcerate. Mm-hmm. So as a woman who was, who's been formerly incarcerated, one of the things that always comes to my mind when we talk about the various issues is dehumanization. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dehumanization as a woman not taking into consideration my past experience, and I'll share my personal journey, being a woman who was struggling with a drug addiction at the time, caught up in a crack era, struggling with a drug addiction, I was totally charged based on the crime that I did and not taking into consideration what was the underlying issue of Mm -hmm. that. Not taking into consideration some of the things that happened to me out on the streets before I came into contact with correctional guards who perpetrated some of that that actual embarrassment and dehumanization as well in the way they talked, in their tone. And sometimes in the way they handled you could actually do your PTSD if you've been a victim of sexual assault or anything else. Mm. One of the stories that I like to share with people that really, um, that actually is embedded in my mind is when I was incarcerated, it was my first incarceration. I was not offered drug court. I was not offered a solution to my drug addiction. I was actually convicted with a felony conviction of the crime that I did. When I was incarcerated, uh, having never experienced it before, I never, re- I would never forget having to go into a shower and strip in front of correctional women, female correctional guards, um, de-lice shower and then being told to bend over squat. When I tell you the tears in the shower Mm. uh, because of just what I was experiencing, nobody prepped me for that. Mm. Nobody took into consideration how I was feeling or what the mental impact of that was doing to me. Although it was procedure, but even letting me know so that it was just not a demand or an order. And I'm already scared walking into this facility, not knowing what to expect. Another one for me was being in this correctional facility, and I was fortunate enough to be in what they called a behavior modification facility. It was addressing some behaviors. um, So it was a program that was actually attached to it. But what I didn't know while I was sitting there, I lost custody of my kids. Mm. They were in the system. And I didn't know that I had 24 months to get my life together or my kids could legally be put up for adoption. And that is a law. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about drug addiction, when I think about prior to that incarceration, I went to drug treatment 13 times. I literally wanted to get my life together, but I was caught up in the addiction of the substance. Mm -hmm. And I remember deliberately so terrified that if I don't get this right, I'm going to be possibly lose my kids for life. Mm -hmm. Right. Is that so, just in New York or is that across the entire I country? Was actually in Ohio, but yeah. that's across the, in various states. I know California has it. We're working with a new way of life to try to uh, abolish it in uh, California. But these are the pressures that are put on women when they're incarcerated. Mm-hmm. So one, we either a substance abuse, mental illness, or sometimes we're incarcerated by who we're attached to. Mm-hmm. We may not have to even have done the crime. We may have been in love with the drug dealer, but we sometimes end up with more time because people say we knew. But then also our kids. And don't talk about, you know, the biggest thing that I deal with, um, and I'm very vocal, I'm very unapologetic. And the reason I've become this way is because society stigmatize a woman who's incarcerated. Yes. It's almost acceptable for a male to be incarcerated. Mm -hmm. But when you're a woman and you had kids, mothers don't do that. Mothers Mm -hmm. don't abandon their kids in that manner. So the stigma that society has put on us, I've been very deliberate of, you won't hold me hostage by my past. Matter of fact, let's talk about what society does, especially to black women and black men. Mm weaponizing it against the criminal justice system, right? Um, So when we talk about these things, we have to talk about the whole picture. I think one of the things that I appreciate, Tamika, about some of the things that you talk about is people like to talk about criminal justice in a silo. Mm -hmm. 
you can't talk about criminal justice without talking about the historical complex of slavery. That's right. Mm -hmm. And how you've utilized the criminal justice record to actually still prohibit individuals from civil rights of you can't live here, you can't work here. If you got convicted of a felony drug offense in some states, you can't even get food stamps. That's a basic human need. Mm -hmm. So just understanding the dynamic, especially when we're talking about a new administrations in the office and we're going to move the needle. What are we moving the needle on? Because it still comes down to the discriminatory, the racial disparities and criminal justice is actually just a catch all of where they kind of cycle us to. But if we actually build the other systems, we can have more success and more thriving communities. Wow, that's crazy. How long were you incarcerated for? I was in, so I did six months in the behavioral uh, modification program, but I did five years on community supervision, which I it's was just, just incarceration. Just, yeah, that's definitely incarceration. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Talk, talk about the 2 million voices campaign. What is that? So the 2 million voices campaign is our attempt to actually include the 2 million people who are currently behind walls mm. in the conversation to have their voices heard. Mm -hmm. to, to, traditionally, you get the prison riots because they're fighting around the conditions of confinement. They're fighting around the actual treatment inside. So how do we start allowing people to hear their voices? Most people drive past a prison, but they never know what goes on inside or behind that wall. Mm. Prison are the best kept secret. Yep, Everybody that's right. knows the battle, that's right. but they don't understand the horrors that go on. So when there's a riot, they always want to say, well, why are they rioting? Why are they killing? They're actually fighting for the mistreatment that's going on, the, um, the actual conditions of confinement. Just take COVID right now. The fact that individuals are actually inside a correctional facility a society is paying attention to COVID, but we've been dealing with disasters all the time. Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Ike, people were sitting in their cells in flooded cells with feces running around. If the electricity goes out, the cells can't open. We just had an ice storm in Texas. They were sitting in correctional facilities without heat. They couldn't even cook in the kitchen and the commissary was still able to profit off of them to sell them prepaid food during the time the state couldn't meet their nutritional needs. My God, selling them food. Yes, selling them food. They still had to fund funds on their commissary. So we did a campaign trying to put commissary funds on people in Texas account so they can buy prepared food. But why are we, when the state is responsible for you, when a judge sentenced you, he sent you off, sentenced you to the custody and care of the state, hmm. meaning they have to meet all your needs, whether it's medical, nutritional, or anything of that nature. And here the state was handicapped, but the state still allowed the for-profit industry to actually benefit at a time when people couldn't even eat inside hmm. of. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. So two million voices gives a voice to the people who are currently incarcerated. That's another issue that I have been explained that oftentimes we talk about the formerly incarcerated and we don't uh, often include the currently incarcerated in their own advocacy work. In Parchman Prison, with what we dealt with there last year, um, it was the prisoners or the, the incarcerated individuals who were the ones to help lead us in terms of explaining what was happening inside the prison and also mm -hmm. being willing to step out. I was nervous for some of those brothers. Mm -hmm. I was nervous that they would be retaliated against, but it got to the point that the conditions were so bad and so many people had died that they were prepared to stand up for themselves and they were ready to join the lawsuit that Rock Nation and Jay-Z brought against Parchment Prison for the inhumane conditions. So we do have to make sure that we give voice to our brothers and sisters who are inside locked in the system. If we didn't have, if the young men or the people, the men, it was men, in MDC in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. when we dealt with the situation there, if they didn't figure out how to bang their cups or whatever on the wall to make the noise that they made, and that was how we would ask them every morning, it was freezing cold to your point, right? They didn't have heat, they didn't have hot water, they didn't even have electricity. And every morning when we wake up, because we, we, when we woke up, we were sleeping outside the jail mm -hmm. with them, when we woke up in the morning, we would ask them, did you eat today? Did you get the blankets? And the way that they communicated, again, being advocates for themselves, was, was to begin on, banging, banging on, on the, the wall. And we could hear them banging on the wall. Yeah, it was, it was, 
you know, being formerly incarcerated after serving seven years myself, I identify with so much of the things you talk about. And I've heard, you know, so many different situations like yourself because I have a lot of friends who are formerly incarcerated. You know, how do people get involved right. with Just Lead? What, what do we have to do to get involved? So people definitely go to our website, sign up. Uh, we have a text messaging service. Just text J-L-U-S-A um, and I'm in to be connected. But definitely we really want volunteers because what we do with our 2 million mm. voices, we literally try to write handwritten letters as mm. our volunteers because nobody understands the importance of a handwritten letter when you are incarcerated. Mm. That's right. Uh, in fact, yes. everybody don't get mail. Ooh, that's one of the biggest yeah. things in the world. <laughs> yes. I know people. That, I know people that will come to you. You get mail, and they just want to read your mail mm. because they don't have any interaction with outside. You know, that's that's one of the forms of trauma and mental issues that we deal with. When you when you're incarcerated, you're so disconnected from society if you don't have a strong unit outside. You know, so just I used to have friends that I used to let them just read my mail, and they would just come to us and read the mail. And, and some of my friends, you know, because I was in the hip hop industry, so they'll be talking about music events and talk, it'd be from different rappers and things like that. So they would just really just enjoy that for days. They'll read the same letter, man. So, you know, that's very important. Very yeah. important. Very important. It so is. we Thank volunteers to please help us. Just a handwritten letter. You don't know how it changes a person like in any day just to get that one piece of mail. Amen. Thank you so much, Deanna Hoskins. We appreciate the work that you guys are doing over at JL USA, Just Leadership USA. Um, you guys are a national organization, so people can go to JLUSA.org to learn more about how they can get involved. And as you said, text, what's the text number again? I think it's 58233. Five eight two three three. Text. I'm in. Yeah. J L U S A. I'm in. And folks can get information about how they can get involved. Thank you for being with us thank today. Thank you for your sacrifice. Oh, thank you guys work. for having me. I appreciate. Thank it. Thank you so much. We appreciate you, Queen. Thank you. Yeah, people don't understand just how important a letter is in prison. You know, I know I have a lot of friends and just a lot of people that I met in prison that I used to see that I used to get mail regularly. I was blessed enough to have a strong support system. While I was in prison, so you know, regularly, pretty much every day or every other day, I would get a letter from somebody, and people would just walk by my cube on my, and be like, "Wow, you got another letter? <laughs> Who's that from? Who's it from?" And then you tell them, and they be like, "Word, what they say?" Did you know? celebrities write you while you yeah, were inside? Yeah, it was a couple of celebrities that wrote me. You know, Mace wrote me a few times. Um, my boy Jay Mills, Vado, uh, Buster wrote me a letter. It was a, it was a couple of dudes. Mm -hmm. That, that wrote me letters while I was incarcerated. I can't remember everybody, but um, there was a lot of people that just wrote me, and it was just fans. Sometimes it was just fan mail, people that I never met that just, you know, was like, yo, I'm a fan of yours or whatever. So I, be, I would just read my letter out loud sometimes and just have people surround my cube. You wow. Know? And they just enjoyed it. They, they would come like, yo, you go, who, who wrote you today? What they said? You know and women saying? that y'all don't even know write you letters. They just find they out your information. They just write you letters, send you pictures. Lord, the pictures. Send you all types of things. You know what I'm saying? So it, it, it really was a, a form of survival. Like. It was a form of survival, especially when you're in a maximum security prison and you only go out for rec like two, three hours a day. You know what I'm saying? So you're in the cell most of the time. So you wait for that mail call and they come by and they walk by the cell, if you got mail, they put it on your gate. And it's like one of the highlights <laughs> of your day. If you get that mail, if you get two or three pieces of mail, you're just like, wow. You put your headphones on, you read the letter, you know what I'm saying? You recreate whatever. Whatever they saying. Whatever so they what's the best way to write the letter? Like, what types of things should people include? Because, you know, if first of all, JLUSA is asking us to write letters to people we don't even know. Mm -hmm. So that's one. And then also, if you don't really write all the time or if you've never really uh, sat down and actually written a letter to somebody who's in, in prison, what do you do? Like, my brother was locked up for most of my teenage years. So I know what it is to... And I saw my parents. They did a lot of writing to him back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, I was responsible for going to the store, buying canned goods of clams, shrimp, mm -hmm. soups, this and that. I mean, the things he had, I was like, and I was only like 13 years old and he would call me on the phone and be like, boo-boo, 
These are the things. Get you a pen and paper. And I had to write down. He wanted clams. He, I didn't even know they sold clam, shrimp, spam. In the can. Um, uh, 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 octopus. Octopus. But what, what's the other? Sardines, Sardines. Tuna fish. I would have to go buy all of that stuff and get him a box. And shout out to Derek. What's up, brother? I know you somewhere watching us. Um, and get him a box and send that stuff. But I saw my family members particularly writing letters. So what does the letter look like? How do you think people should start the letter out? Well, you know, it depends on what it is that you're doing, who you're communicating with, you know what I'm saying? A lot of times, if you don't know the person, you know, what you want to do is sort of, hey, my name is such and such, you know, I'm just writing because I know what it, what you're going through. Try to give them some current events, give them a little understanding of who you are, this is what I do, this is what I'm into, I got a job, you know, I'm working, you know, I just wanted to reach out to you. And then you create a dialogue. It's just like meeting somebody. You know, you write an introductory letter, and then the person writes back and says, well, I'm glad, you know... And they start asking you questions, you know what I'm saying? So you have to choose because it's, it's good to write letters, but then you don't want to get too intimate with somebody unless you're trying to get intimate with them. But what if you, unless you're trying, <laughs> no, to, get unless you're trying to get but intimate with them? But what if, but, but should your letter, like, do you, you don't want to, like, make your life seem so great to somebody who is incarcerated. Like, what, how much is too much of telling them about, like, what you're doing and what you have and, you know, your experiences? Because you said that you want to exactly. help them recreate. Life yeah, and exactly that's what I'm saying. So you have to, you have to. It's like any conversation, right? You know when you you know how much information you want to divulge to anybody. So mm -hmm. if you meet somebody and you they're trying to meet you or know you, if you're trying to just have a platonic friendship, then you have a platonic conversation. <laughs> and you know, and, and when they try another way, you derail it and you bring it back to the situation. So you, you always stay on point of what it is that you're doing. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of them are lonely. They don't have. Women in their lives, you know what I'm saying? So if you're a woman and you're writing to a man and you're communicating with him, you got to be aware of what, what it is that Where's you're doing. Where's the line? Where's the line I'm drawing? You understand what I'm saying? And, and, they'll, and they'll respect the line because they just want the communication. So they won't go over a line that you don't cross. But if you cross the line, then they're going to keep pushing it a little further, just like any other situation. You know what I'm saying? So you got to be mindful of that, man. And that brings me... To what you don't get? What I don't get. <laughs> You know, and I was sitting here thinking about what I was going to say my, I don't get. And it's about being in prison, right? You know, it's it's so what? Because Bobby Smurda just came home from prison, right? Mm. And it was this big thing online. And everybody in the world. And I'm not saying that everybody wasn't doing it. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying that. Doing what? Wasn't, sell, wasn't wishing him good. Wasn't contacting him. Wasn't reaching out to him. Wasn't... Saying he was the biggest thing in the world. I'm not saying they weren't. I don't. I don't know if they were. You but know? there were some people. But there were some people. It became the biggest thing in the world. You know, in in two days he had three million followers on Instagram. Everybody was talking about Bobby Smurders, the king of New York. This and that. He was on the cover of GQ. I didn't see none of these people reaching out for the last six years. You understand what I'm saying? And and it's, and, and and I don't get why you know we support. These people, when they're coming home, but when they're going through, and then Casanova actually put out a, a you know message. He said, you know, I'm glad to see the support for Bobby, and everybody's screaming, free me, but I'm an hour away and ain't seen nobody yet. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So it's I don't get why people want to celebrate everybody when you're on your way home and everything's good, but when, you know, when you're going through that, and then he's sentenced to the six years, I didn't see these these people. I didn't hear all of this love, and you know, you were here here and there. Some people that was like, "Yo, we love Bobby Boom," so, showing support. But I just don't get why people don't show the support when you need it. Because when you're going through that bid and you're sitting there for all that time, you need it. You know what I'm saying? Because I remember when I first came home, it was a lot of people that I didn't see or hear from my whole bid. You know, that was like, "Yo, my son's coming home." I was listening because I was, you know, able to hear the radio and certain things because I had came to. Um, Queensboro, which is right in New York, so I was able to hear High 97. I was hearing rappers that I never even knew supported me. It was like, yo, shout out to him and this and that and magazines and it was everywhere. But when I was going through my bed, I didn't see them. I didn't hear mm. nothing from them. Nobody sent me a dollar. So nobody came to visit me. So, you know, I just don't get why people support you when you don't need the support. You know what I'm saying? When I'm free, I don't need your support. But so, if, well, okay, so let me ask this question. Mm -hmm. 
Huh, let's see. What about the idea that some people might feel like you're actually guilty of something that they don't necessarily want to be affiliated with, but after you do your time, then they kind of feel like, okay, you know, now it's time to say you did what you did and you, and you, you have paid your debt to society and now we should re-welcome um, you to the community. Now, yeah. by the way, I don't think that that's the reason, but I'm just asking. Yeah, I don't think that even really makes sense because it's once I'm sentenced, advocate. yeah, because once I'm sentenced, right, and I and I have to do my time, then you know I'm I'm paying my debt to society. Mm. So, I now I have to survive throughout this. You understand what I'm saying? So, if you don't care whether I survive to get through it, why you want to celebrate me when I got so to it? So if you didn't rock with me then, don't rock with me now. It doesn't make sense. And you I think it's because they look... They, they, I think it's they cloud think it's chasing. Uh, yeah, they want to jump on the bandwagon. It's yeah. called bandwagon. You understand what I'm saying? And, and as much as I, I believe Bobby Smurda deserved, you know what I'm saying? He was a young boy, 1920. I actually, like I said, I actually was part of a program, you know, that with the bartenders that were called, was called Mind Up, man, you know, that we went... And we did exercise with the kids. We had uh, classes with the uh, brother Hassan. Brother, my brother Hassan. You know, I spoke to him the other day. Real good brother, man. Real sharp brother. Always show me love. And we went in there weekly, two times a week. And his house was one of the houses that I was designated to. So I would talk to him two days a week for a few months. You know, until he was moved. You know, and we used to when we built. You know, and 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 I realized he was real young, man. And 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 I knew he was growing in his mind had it evolved and he realized the mistakes he made. And when you hear him now, he's like, yo, I'm not going to do the same thing. I'm staying away from the same people. I, I, I got caught up in some stuff. And he did his time, you know, honorably in my, in my consider, you know, the way I consider honorably, like I don't celebrate criminality. That's what people think. I, when you have integrity, when you are man enough to face the consequences of your actions without trying to be coward enough to, cause you can't face your actions try to make sure that somebody else faced the consequences of theirs, right? Mm -hmm. And not only did he do that, he was able, willing to take more time so that his friend would be able to come home. You understand what I'm saying? Th those are things that I call integrity and I call honor. And you move, and you take that and you deal with that and you and you evolve mm -hmm. from that, you mm -hmm. know? So I believe he needs to be celebrated. I, need, I believe he needs to be respected, but and, I just... But it's also about encouragement. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You need to be encouraged because you need somebody to say, yo, you did your time, you did this, and we want to show you that you can come home and be successful. And you, we, we're not going to, we're going to make sure, like I, I put on my post, you know, everybody celebrating, Bobby. Just make sure that you protect him, mm. that you don't put, don't be around him and put him in a situation to where he can lose his freedom again. So let's not celebrate him and then have him around situations and have him around people that don't have real love for him. You know, so, you know, w once again, I, I support him and I'm happy that people support him, but I just don't get why people didn't been, wasn't been doing it. Why wasn't, <laughs> wasn't been, wasn't been, <laughs> people wasn't been, wasn't been, he wasn't been, but, you know, I, I will say though that I saw in the comments as Teslin was talking about someone try to challenge you like, oh, well, you know, why all of a sudden you, you know, uh, t you know, uh, uh, praising them or whatever. I call it upliftment, but they might use the word praise. And you said, yo, this is not new for me. Like, I actually have been inside Rikers Island working with this young man for yeah. a period of time. Like, folks think they know everything. You know, and that's part of life, man. And, you know, I, I'm not mad that people have an opinion, you mm -hmm. know. You, like I tell people all the time, you are... You are entitled to your own opinion, not your own facts. Well, that's, that's you know what I'm saying. So, and everybody try to make their opinions facts, and it's not yeah, true. But you kind of think that your opinions is facts sometimes. No, but, no you know. my opinion is is based on facts. It's based on situations that I can point to mm -hmm. and give you points. You just can't give me uh -huh. an open ended opinion uh -huh. that don't have nothing to support it. Uh -huh. Give me some supporting uh -huh. factors to support you your your opinions. You think sometimes you think they're facts. But yeah. I, you know, I'm gonna leave that alone. You know? And we're gonna leave it alone, and we're gonna end this show on that. <laughs> it's been a, it's been a great it's show. It's been a great show. Great show. Thanks to everybody that came out. As usual, we may not always agree. <laughs> Tamika will not always be wrong, and I will not always be right. But we will both always be like that. Yes. Yes. Salute. See you next week. That's how we own it.